So it's long been assumed that government regulatory agencies would be the controlling arm in the arena of workers' compensation. When workers' compensation first came out, the risk management group was a little bit oblivious. The costs of management were theirs, but the benefits were not their, their reward. We perceived that it was another government-mandated program. The single remedy, no-fault doctrine in workers' compensation was something that they didn't feel they could manage. Lo and behold, time went on, and costs of workers' compensation went up, right? We had things like new injury modalities. We had imaginative judges and liberal lawyers that brought litigation into the workers' comp system. And all of a sudden, these new injury modalities, you know them as musculoskeletal disorders, and you know them as cumulative trauma, repetitive motion injuries, and new things like reflex sympathetic dystrophy and chronic pain syndrome all of a sudden became part of the workers' comp system, making it more and more important for management to try to look at what was causing these things and try to do something about it. Right? That's not an easy thing to do. In most of the industries that I've worked with over the last 40 plus years, if you look across all the industries, we could probably do a show of hands. What's the one thing that drives the workers' compensation costs? If you think about losses, you think about strain and sprains, slips and falls, bing bangs and bumps. What's the one that's keeping everybody up at night? Anybody? The strain and sprains, am I right? Is that what keeps you up at night? So why is that? Well, there's a lot of reasons for it. One is there's a lack of um, medical protocols for managing strain and sprains. There's a difference across 50 states with different legislative uh, results from benefit levels and, and things like that. It's difficult to manage, hard to return to work. Lack of universal medical programs, soft tissue injuries are the most difficult to treat, diagnose, and return to work. They just are. Now we add aging workforce factors onto that, add Medicare set-asides on top of that, and you've got a significant financial burden. What is the average cost of a strain and sprain claim? So being in the industry for a long time, I can tell you it runs between twenty-five dollars and $30,000. That's the average cost that we as an insurance company would pay for a strain and sprain claim. So we talked a lot about in the last couple of panels about ROI. How do you take that $30,000 average cost of claim and turn it into an ROI for an intervention that you want to propose? Take that $30,000 and for most companies that are larger, they're mostly self-insured, right? They have large deductibles or they're totally self-insured. So that $30,000 they pay first dollar out of their pocket. The cost to manage that claim is probably three, four, or more times that initial cost. So if you have a $25,000 strain claim and the internal cost to manage that claim are four to one times that $25,000, that's a $100,000 loss cost, right? And if you're operating at a 10% profit margin, that's a million dollar hit on revenue, am I right? So if you wanna look at simple ROI, think about those numbers and think about now I'm at 100, I got a million dollar hit on, on my ROI a million dollar hit on my revenue, and I want to put up $25,000, $50,000, $100,000 intervention in place. Does it make more sense now? Right? So from a dollars and cents perspective, managing workers' comp can be a substantial benefit. And we've talked about for the last two days, AR, VR, and wearable technologies, and how we can impact efficiency, profitability, productivity. So when you think about a company that runs 30 to 50% of their expense of doing business tied up in human factors, every time I have an injury accident, I'm impacting absenteeism, I'm impacting efficiency, I'm impacting productivity, not to mention all the things you just heard from the last panel about the moral aspects of making sure our most important people get home safe. Right? So when I look at interventions with a, from a risk management standpoint, and I spend a lot of time with risk managers over the last 20 years, and I would sit down with the, each one of them individually, and I would say, what's keeping you up at night? What do you need help with? What are you working on? What's not working? What is working? What do you want to do in the future? Where do you want to go? 
And many, many of the risk managers I talk to say, you know what, I just can't manage this workers' comp system. It's not just safety and health, it's the system itself. A risk manager doesn't want surprises, right? That's the last thing they want. They want to have predictive risk. Their job is to make sure that whatever the risks are that the business faces, they've either got a risk transfer policy that's going to keep them out of trouble, or they've got a risk management program that is going to keep the risk to a minimum. But surprises are the one thing that they can't stand. So managing the exposure out of the employment factors, managing exposure and risk out of the task is the most important thing you can do. Where does wearables come in? Wearables is a new thing. Wearables is something that we've taken to the next level to be able to give us either quantifiability of risk or to actually reduce risk, mitigate risk, manage risk in some way. A lot of times wearables, I started working with wearables, believe it or not, in the late 80s. In the late 90s, we were using wearable technologies, EMG, to look at post-loss injury management. If you look at the little circle on the diagram, you see that what I'm suggesting is that wearables can be used in all three buckets of opportunity in managing workers' comp. What are those buckets? Hiring, screening, and deployment. Prevention and training. Prevention including risk mitigation, risk elimination. And post-loss injury management. How many of you have used wearable technologies to improve post-loss injury management. Can you do it? Do you think you can do it? Hopefully I'll show you where you can. So we're gonna look at a little bit about wearables, application in workers' comp, what level of effort and resources are required. I'm gonna skip over that a little bit because you guys have talked about it a lot for the last two days. How much technology do you need and what is the end game? You've heard that a couple of times from some of the panels, especially this morning. What am I trying to get to? Am I chasing the next shiny brass ring or am I trying to make a difference at some level, at some task, at some risk, at some operation? When I start a project with a risk management team, the first thing I say to them is, I wanna be able to speak to facilities, operations, HR, eh &S, and everybody else who touches that process. So I want to make sure that the proof of concept and the scope of work and the pilots that we do get to the deliverable that you want to achieve. And that's the most important thing for me anyway, because I'm, when I'm all done, I want to make sure that what we've done and what we've completed and what we've implemented makes a difference for them in their bottom line and in their safety metrics. Those are the two things. In order to do that, I have to make sure they understand the scope of work and the problem. Data is huge. If you think about the insurance industry over the last five years, the things that have been the buzzwords, besides cybersecurity and Safety Act and Active Shooter, data mining, deep dive analytics, predictive analytics, and wearable technologies have been the big three things that risk managers are talking about. So we're going to look at some of these uh, areas that fit that, that little ring there. Hiring, screening, and deployment, prevention, and training, post-loss injury management. That's where I feel that wearables, and that's where I've seen wearables make a difference. Um, defining wearables, biosensor devices that provide data and feedback, usually through the internet. It's as simple as I could make it. I was trying to come up with a wearables definition that fit all the different things that we've been talking about over the last couple of days. I hope that works, works for you. But the thing that's most important is, for me, I want to understand What's the data say? Where are the pain points? What are the things we're trying to accomplish? Where are we trying to get to? Is it a specific task? Is it an operation? What are, where am I trying to go? Am I trying to look at fleet? Am I looking at workers' comp? Am I looking at products liability? What, what am I trying to accomplish? And I get that from the risk manager and the risk management team. Wearables, I think, from if you think about a company, risk managers are, are in corner A, you got eh &S in corner B, operations in corner C, and maybe you've got some folks over here on the HR side that actually have to manage the claims a lot of time, and they're in corner D. And you'd be surprised how, how often those four corners don't talk to each other. So one of the things that I do in a project is make sure that I've tapped into all four pieces, because you know what, a lot of times the implementation of the wearables that I wanna do reside with the purse strings that are sitting in operations. And sometimes operations and risk management and HR don't talk about why is HR so important to include in a wearables project? So I'm going to put a biosensor on, on you. 
and I'm going to use EMG and an inclinometer, and you have to pull your shirt up, and I'm going to have to shave your back, and then I'm going to have to get some glue, and I'm going to have to spray you with some aesthetic, and then I got to make sure that you don't have any allergies, and then I'm going to tape you up and send you out into the workforce. Think it's a good idea to include HR in that project planning? Yeah, it, it is. Okay. So the data is the place to start, but you always, want to, you always want to know the exposure model. I can do a lot with numbers, and I can see the numbers, and I can use the data analytics, and I have some idea of what I'm faced with just because I've been doing this for so long, 40-something years. But I also need to know the exposure model. I need to talk to and meet with those people who run the operations and the facilities to understand what the true exposure is. What's one of the best ways to do that? You go to the, op the, operation, the employee who's doing the operation, and you say, what's the toughest part of your job? If you could, what would you do different? Right? I just got a, a, a request from a risk manager from a large entertainment company that you know as Monster Truck or Marvel Comics or something like that. Um, and they said, we're going to have a new show, and we've got 150-pound performers wearing 125-pound costumes. What do we do? I said, what, what, what do you do about what? Well, we're afraid that the, the heavy costumes that they're going to be wearing is going to create injuries and accidents, et cetera, et cetera. Well, okay, so can you reduce the weight of the costumes? Brilliant, right? I thought well, not, that went up all by myself. Can you reduce the weight of the costumes? Well, we already went from 175 to 125, and we got to go out on the road in two weeks, and we don't have enough time to, to redesign the costumes. I said, okay, give me a chance one day I want to talk to HR, I want to talk to choreography, I want to talk to the athletic trainer, I want to talk to eh &S, and most importantly, I want to see a practice show, and I want a focus group with all the performers who are wearing these, these costumes. And we came up with, after one day, 10 different things they could do to make a difference in the exposure to those employees wearing those costumes that had nothing to do with redesigning the the costume itself. But I needed to know the data, I needed to do the exposure model, and I needed to talk to all the people that were involved, especially choreography and the athletic trainer. And you, surprisingly en enough, the athletic trainer who was doing the strength and conditioning had never talked to the choreographer who was putting them into the show paces for that show. And the costume designer and athletic trainer had never talked until I put them in a focus group together. Anyway, all right, so. Did you just hire your next injury? Can you use wearable technology to do a better job of, of em employment screening? Is employment screening important? When you have high force, high repetition, poor posture tasks, and you can't redesign the operation, then hiring the right person for the job who can manage that job well is a good bet. Can I use wearables to do that? Yes, I can. How do I do that? Well, one, one place to start is a physical demands analysis for that particular job. What does that person really have to do? You walk through the warehouse with an eh &S director, and you see a whole bunch of things. We have this safety vision that we look through. And we see things that are exposures, and we go, oh, there. oh that's an exposure. Oh, that's an exposure. The eh &S person or the warehouse manager or the operations manager sees it every day. And it's kind of like seeing the, trying to see the forest through the trees. Right? They're just used to it. That's the way it is. That's the way it's always been. That's the way it always will be. Not much we can do about it. This is the operation. You come in with a different set of eyes, and if you put some wearables on somebody and track what they really have to do from a physical standpoint, you can go to operations with that data and that dashboard and say, hey, look, did you know how much, how many, how often? Yeah, look, that person had to pick up a box. OK, keep walking. That's what they have to do, have to pick up a box. But we can use the data and, and the wearables to document how much, how many, how often that they have to do that. And then, we can, then when you show that to operations, they say, wow, I, I didn't know. And they're in the plant every day. And yet, we're, we're surprised. Here's an example of where we can use posture to, and, and maybe impact behavior. So we can use wearables, in this case, to document exposure, but we can also use it to maybe change behavior. Um, I didn't put the name on this device. Some of you may know what it is. I'm not going to mention it. But um, here's an opportunity where I can, uh, where I can adjust the, the degrees out of neutral that I want to
to correlate with exposure based on the weights that the person is moving. Why is that important? Because if I'm lifting a 15-pound weight, I can probably go 30, 40 degrees outside in neutral and not have a, an, an unusual load on my back. But if I'm lifting a 75 pound weight, I'm gonna have, a, have to adjust those degrees out of neutral to make a difference in my exposure, right? 75 pound weight puts a lot more load on my back or my, and my shoulders. And by the way, the shoulders are the new back, right? Everybody knows that? Have you heard that before? Okay, so when, when we're looking at this, it gives me an opportunity to do a couple of things. One, I can use it for training. Two, I can use it for behavior monitoring. If I move outside in neutral, I get a little buzz on my hip, and it tells me that, oh, I, I moved outside in neutral. Now, if I'm wearing this device all day long, and I have been taught to bend with my knees, pull the weight close, lift with my legs, hold the weight close, and move it, that's a good thing. But if you're old like me, and your knees don't work, when nobody's looking, you stop bending with your knees, right? And you start lifting with your back again. So now you got Bob and Bill and Joe, and they're all wearing the same monitor. They're all doing the same job, but you got a completely different dashboard. One guy has neutral postures 80% of the time, neutral postures. One guy, 60%. One guy, hardly ever. And you say to the guy who doesn't have the good neutral postures, what's going on? But you see that dashboard. You can bring them in, and you can talk to them, and their operations people and their supervisors. You can say, why can Joe and Bill do it, but Bob can't do it? And then you start to get to the point where that dashboard points to what I just said, how much, how many, how often, what tasks. A lot of times we look at a task, but a lot of times an employee will do multiple tasks during the, during the time of the day, right? So we wanna be able to do that, and then I can change behavior, but also you have to be cognizant of this. I'm working all day and I'm wearing a buzzer, and every time I move outside in neutrals, the buzzer goes off, and if I can't do anything about that task, and I have no choice but to move outside of neutral, what's my mindset going to be wearing this device? In a very short time, I'm going to be very anxious and very angry. So you have to know what the exposure model is. You know what you're trying to get to. You know what, how you're going to use these devices, where and when. And you have to be able to control the pilot or the program that you're doing so that you don't put your employees in a position where they're going to be very, very aggressive about not wanting to be involved in this. So here's a force and posture monitor. I can look at force over time through a full range of motion. Why is that important? Well, a couple of reasons. The AMA 5th edition guidelines look at range of motion as a most important thing they can consider in terms of disability, right? So that's number one. Number two, range of motion outside of neutral postures is, is difficult on the knees, the back, the shoulders. And we wanna look at sustained movement, not just single force movements, because overexertion is part one, but fatigue and endurance are part two. Fatigue and endurance drive your cumulative trauma and your repetitive motion injuries. And then there's a static stress. Somebody talked about it at the last panel. Static stress is important, right? Because if you think about um, standing up in one position, doing the same motion with your arms, but not moving your legs and your back, that's static stress. That can be almost as egregious as doing repetitive motion over time. So this is something that I can do, but I have, to, I have to bring you in, I have to put you in a secure area, I have to shave your back, I have to use a, a spray glue, I have to put tape on you to hold the monitors in place, and then I have a dashboard. But the value is really neat. Can you run this one? Click on the little arrow at the bottom. There you go. So here what you're seeing is the person's wearing those devices you just saw. And if you look at the red line going across the screen, you can see every time she squeezes the nozzle in the epoxy gun, you get the EMG readings. At the same time, you're looking at posture, right? And as you go through this full range of motion. So this was, this was a project that I did in 2014. And what we did with this is we did three or four different tasks. And the value in it was not that we could give the customer ergonomic intervention ideas. I could just look at that task before I did any of this and know what things we had to change or could change to make a difference in the exposure to the employee. I knew it right away. The value in this data is to bring it to the operations manager and say, hey, look, this is what's going on. The operations manager walked through that plan every day and never noticed anything wrong with this task. The value of this particular project is in showing 
force and posture through a full range of motion through the entire task. And when the operation manager saw this, he bought into the idea of doing something and making a difference. Um, continuous monitoring, you don't have to use um, de devices directly on the skin. Nowadays, there's compression vests with EMG and inclinometers in them already. You can use these connected for continuous monitoring throughout the day. You can connect it to your iPhone. You can connect it to a, whatever database you're using. This is really neat. It's easy to use. It's less egregious on the employee. The unions won't balk as much as if you're pulling somebody's shirt up and shaving their back. So this is a really, a really cool thing. You can also use wearables to look at process mapping which I really like this idea. This is a continuous process, especially good when one employee is doing multiple tasks throughout the day, right? Because you wanna do a PDA, but you do it for a specific task. Then you wanna look at what they're doing throughout the entire day, you have to do something like this. So it gives you process mapping, time, right? As well as exposure. And you can track their entire motion throughout the day into a dashboard and you can see exactly when and where they're having the most difficult motions. You can, so timing, repetition. I went into a, uh, uh, digress for a minute, went into a uh, meat processing chicken plant and we took a little tour of the plant and the conveyor is moving at such a speed that we're handling 30 pound chickens and turkeys at about one and a half seconds a piece, right? So I'm lifting a 30, 40 pound turkey every one and a half or so seconds. So of course my initial reaction to the operations manager was, let's reduce the exposure by doing, let's slow the conveyor down. What do you think his answer was? <laughs> yeah, that was a hard one, right? So he said, yeah, the last guy that was here as a consultant suggested that. He's not here anymore. You wanna try again? And I said, okay, well, let's look for something else then. All right, so we can use RFID chips. Anybody familiar with this? RFID chips can map exposure in a facility and give the heads up to the, um, to the employee that they're about to do something or go somewhere that they shouldn't. RFID chips are really neat, especially good on a construction site where it's late in the day, it's dusty, it's noisy. I can have an RFID chip in a vest or a hat connected to the guy who's sitting in the backhoe. I'm working the jackhammer, I can't hear anything. But as the jackhammer person and the backhoe get close together, they both get a signal that they're about to have contact, that they shouldn't. So RFID chips are a pretty neat thing that we can do. Man down monitoring, you heard about this before. Um, this is an interesting one. You don't need wearables to know that this is not a smart thing. Somebody talked about in the last panel about... Um, uh, <laughs> But man down monitoring is pretty cool. Maybe not in this example, we probably should be doing some other things. But uh, to give you an example, I've used man down monitoring through in cell phones to identify people who are working in remote locations so that if something bad does happen, somebody knows about it. For example, we had a large uh, visiting nurse association in the greater New York area and um, they were out by themselves visiting patients, getting chased by dogs, falling downstairs, getting beat up by patients. And so we wanted to know right away if something bad happened. So we use this man down monitoring connected to their phone so they could do that. This is a really interesting one. I love this. Think about this. Imagine multi-channel surface EMG through a full range of motion, right? That maps the musculoskeletal system. That gives you a neurosurgeon's report it's almost a lie detector test of your musculoskeletal system. So let's say that your HR manager says, you know, I don't want to do any pre-hire screening because I'm afraid of ADA and EEOC. What I really want to do is something else. What else? So now I can take a, a benchmark of the musculoskeletal system by using multi-channel surface EMG. Think about a multiplexing system in a security system where you're getting multiple feeds at the same time through an, a complete range of motion, right? So I can take a blueprint of the musculoskeletal system as you are today. So if I was gonna get hired, you were gonna hire me to work in a warehouse. So I'm old. And you know, I could probably go and take one of those football physicals we took in high school. I could do a couple push-ups, I could do a couple of jumping jacks. My blood pressure's not too bad when I'm not at work. I'd probably pass, right? Would you wanna put me out on a warehouse for 10 hours a day, six days a week? I can tell you, you wouldn't. I'd, I'd be, 
So if you can't do an initial screening, you can take a blueprint of the musculoskeletal system and you don't have to look at it. You can put it away, put it in an electronic lockbox. If I'm 50 years old and I was hired last week and I go out on the warehouse and I strain my back, I get screened a second time the same way. And by the way, this is an FDA class two registered device, just like an MRI. FDA approved. Now I can screen you a second time and I can see if there's a change in condition. If there is a change in condition, I know exactly what it is. How many times do you get hurt and it's, it's an oh my claim, oh my shoulder, it's been bothering me for two weeks. Okay, uh, go to the emergency room or go to the doctor. The doctor sees you and says, uh, so does it hurt? Does it hurt a lot? Yeah, can you raise your arm? Can you lift your leg? No, okay, good. So uh, I think you should go home for two weeks or I can send you across the street and you can go to physical therapy for 12 weeks. Good idea. So you go to physical therapy with a script that says PT and you talk to the college student because the physical therapist is out playing golf with the doctors. And then you get the same PT routine as everybody else. The soccer mom, the kids playing baseball, you get the same physical therapy routine. With this, I know exactly what's going on, what's broke, how broke it is, and where it is. And I can give you palliative physical therapy for a short period of time. I can close the timeline on the claim, I can get to medical uh, MMI sooner, and I can safely return to work because I know what's broke and I know when you're fixed. So this is using wearable technologies, Surface EMG, which we're really familiar with, through a full range of motion to give me an edge when I'm hiring older folks, right? You don't have to make me 16 again after I get injured. You only have to bring me back to pre-injury status. This gives me an opportunity to deal with the comorbidity the ICD-9 codes, the ICD-10 codes, right? If you're, if you're hypertensive, diabetes, uh, obese, and you have a strain claim, you're probably gonna have to manage those issues first before you can get better from your work-related injury. It's all gonna complicate things, and it's gonna make you be out of work longer. And we know that 10% of the claims drive 90% of the dollars. We know that 30 to 50% of the claims are gonna run as uh, soft tissue injuries. Right? And we know that the average cost of claim is going to be a lot greater than every other type of claim that I'm having. So if I can manage those soft tissue claims better, I'm in a really good position. Whoop, I'm going backwards. Wait a minute. Okay. So here's, here's what you can do with the wearables. You can look at objective evidence-based early diagnosis, early diagnosis, early in the life of the claim to make a difference going forward. I can use, I have better uh, treatment regimen. I have predictive outcome enhancement and I have safe return to work. That's what's key, because that's what makes a difference. Exoskeletons, I'm not gonna go into them too much, only to say that be careful that you're not chasing the shiny br brass ring. I've done some pilots with exoskeletons, actually many, and what I'm doing now is I'm using biosensors to initially track the task, to look at what the exposure model is, then I put the exoskeleton on with the biosensors and I see if there's actually a change in exposure. Did, it, did the exoskeleton really make a difference in what's likely to cause a soft tissue injury? There are many that you can, you can do now, but how do you know that the exoskeleton is really making a difference in the exposure? You can take out the force, but if you still have the, the endurance and fatigue factors, and if you still have the repetitive motion issues, you could still wind up with a claim, right? Um, AR, VR, I'm not going to go into this in great depth because you've heard about it for two days. Quality, efficiency, productivity, inspections, manufacturing, repair. New hire and existing employees on the job training, huge for that. One thing I didn't hear anybody mention is accident investigation and, and recreation or root cause analysis work. AR, VR can be huge in that, in that puzzle, right? I can use AR, VR to do a better job in recreation, root cause analysis, and accident investigation, which translates into better training going forward. Process drives results. If I know what the process is, how many times do we have a process that we design that we expect one, two, or more injury accidents per year, per month, right? If you're having an injury accident, you got to look backwards at the process. To look backwards at the process, well, you have to have good root cause analysis. Is this an accident? Anybody? Yay, yay or no? Good. Is that, right, it, yeah. So it, my question is this, can you, 
Can you imagine what this guy's face looks like? <laughs> right? Is that an accident? Yeah, of course. It's any unplanned event that results in a, in a loss or not. Is this an accident? The question is, is the process right? Can you imagine what these guys' faces look like? Do you think they're surprised? Would the risk manager be happy to hear about this? No. Right? This is, oh, we're running out of time. This is an accident. Wearable technologies can, we started a little late. Do I have a couple seconds or no? Yes. Okay. So other, other wearables that you can use, if you can't do anything else, right? If you can't change process, if you can't redesign exposure out, what can you do? This is an excellent tool when you've got endurance and fatigue factors. This is an athletic, this compression sleeve. It's articulating pressure from proximal to distal. So what you're getting is not only blood flow impact, but you're also getting lymphatic system benefit. This, this came out of cancer research. Somebody who had breast cancer and take, and take out the lymph nodes, you get swelling. These, these things were designed to reduce the swelling, and they work just as well in, in uh, industrial environment. I had a, um, a meat processor, and the, the nurse said to me that she was getting 50 out of 400 people, she was getting 50 people coming to her office every day saying, uh, we need a splint, we need an armband, we need a wrap. We put these compression sleeves in place, and she went from 50 a day to 10 a day. Subjective evaluation, yeah. But we're looking at 18 months with a 20% reduction in strain and sprain injuries to the upper extremity, huge. There's a whole bunch of other um, wearables. This is uh, articulating massage therapy. If you have endurance and fatigue factors, you can put somebody in here for five minutes, get compression up and down the upper extremities, lower extremities, even the back, and reduce the exposure. Voice activated lie detector test for people who want in a security space or if they're in a space where they want to do some hiring and they want to know if they're hiring the next bad actor. This is really neat. It comes out of Iraq and Afghanistan in, in, those, in those areas where security was really important. And the results have been amazing. 30, 40% reduction in, um, in injury accidents and fraud. Uh, doing the same thing the same way, but different. Uh, the goal is, what's your pain point? What's your end game? What ROI do you want to achieve? If you continue to do, a lot of times, you, you would be surprised how many times people say, hey, uh, I, <laughs> she finally made it. Um, what are the solution options? Do you proof of concept? Do you pilot? Do your implementation. Measure and monitor. You have to know what you're trying to capture, where you're trying to get to, so that you can measure and monitor and improve your ROI. Every time I do a project, I have to know what the deliverable is going to be. I have to know what my ROI expectation is going to be so that I can plan properly to give the risk manager the right interventions and solutions that the company can manage. What can you manage today? What can you manage in the future? OK, so wearables can be used to document exposure, change behavior, mitigate exposure, diagnostic, diagnose exposure, achieve safe early return to work, manage your hiring process, manage your prevention and training, help you with all of these different things. They, they are really neat. You have to know what you're doing. You have to know what you're trying to get to. You have to pick the right wearables for the task, not the next shiny brass ring. That's it. I don't, I don't think I could have done it any faster. <laughs> Brian, you want to do questions? Any questions? Good. I think now it's break. Thanks. <laughs>